recording and we are live. This screen is not on, by the way. Oh, it's not on. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to call to order the Town of Frazier's regular board meeting on uh, February 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. Can I please have a roll call? Katie Fisher. <clears throat> Louis Gregory. Eileen Waldo. Brian Zirkmack. Katie Souls. And Philip Vandernail. Um, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So move. And a second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which only has the minutes from January 18th, 2023? I so move. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are, um, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Um, if you haven't signed in yet here in, in the building, there's a sign in sheet over here. Um, when we get to, um, well, we're headed yeah. into open forum. So um, on here in the, in the audience, you raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you, come up to the podium, state your name, um, and if you live in the town of Frazier or not, um, you don't have to give a specific address of where you live. Um, for sure. Um, we're going to give you three minutes um, and uh, Michael or Internet or Rob will be timing that and we will cut you off at three minutes. So um, not 301 or 305, uh, three minutes uh, for open forum. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to start that process now. So anybody here in the building that um, would like to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. Now's your chance to address the board. Okay. Hi, thank you. I'm Jody Dochef, board chair of Middle Park Health, based out of Kremling, Colorado, in the Kremling Hospital District. I'm, is this this is on the agenda? Agenda. Oh, okay. So we'll we'll wait for that. Yeah. So okay. this is open form is for items not on, on the, the agenda. agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here in the audience? Okay, anybody online? You can raise your hand digitally or you can, um, or, or do we have anybody online? No, no one's online. Right. Okay, well, that, that ends that. Okay, we are now at discussion, possible action. And um, first up is um, resolution 2023-0201 water system model update and Lucas is going to be briefing the board on this. So. All right, Mayor Vandernail and members of the board, I'm here to seek approval to use funds from our engineering fees um, and to use hey, those Lucas, funds. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to move that mic closer okay. to you or? And make sure it's on there. So it's on. Okay. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm here to ask for the use of uh, funds from our engineering fees budget in order to update and calibrate and verify our water model for upcoming projects. Um, the amount to not exceed 38,258 with an available balance for 2023 is for 70,000 for engineering fees. Um, a working town water model is necessary to analyze and approve changes to the town's water system for future development projects. The existing town water model was created by Brown and Codwell for the 2008 water master supply study um, there were updates over the years, uh, last most recent one being in 2017. Um, it is the belief of Merrick that in order to approve or vet some of our future development projects and its effects on our water system model, that we need to have that calibrated and adjusted and working up to its optimum standards. Um, otherwise, uh, as the water superintendent, I'm unable to I'm not an engineer, I don't have a water model, I'm unable to vet uh, a lot of these projects thoroughly and we need our 
town engineer to essentially give the go ahead and recommendations for much of our future development. Uh, any questions? I have a question. Um, so why was um, the, well, it was optional, but the development design review and modeling of specific infrastructure questions deleted. And there was also the one about um, the connection with Winter Park Ranch and Grand County One was deleted. So I don't know if that question is for you or if it's for Ed. Uh, yes. Um, essentially, the, the original budget, I decided to negotiate more with Merrick and try to get a better scope of what we need okay. at this point. And currently, uh, the inner connect <sighs> was not is not being pursued by the town at this point. Yeah, it's not imminent. Yeah, so I was trying to bring the, the costs down in order to allow, you know, we, I don't want to spend our entire engineering budget just on the water model. And a lot of these uh, objects, I believe, can be tied into the costs of the future projects. So we use the water model, then as the project comes, then we can use funds associated with that project in order to vet the project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the work? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, just to clarify, this is just to do a, a study or assessment of the water system? Uh, yes, um, it, it pretty much what it does is as we make changes to the water system, uh, most of it involves fire flow to make sure we have enough capacity in case of fire. Because um, as you pull water from some parts of the system, as you change things, it can cause uh, low pressure events. And if we fall below a certain pressure threshold, it can cause uh, inflow into the water system. So essentially what this does is allows us to project what would happen in certain events to make sure we have sufficient water pressure throughout the rest of the system as we make changes. Okay, it, it says on their subject that add additional infrastructure, are you actually gonna be upgrading the system or just is it just to study the system? Um, it's essentially so we can tell, for one thing, uh, we do have existing deficiencies and technology has you know, come a long way since 2008. And at the same time, it's for you know, future projects. I mean, there's a West Mountain project and we wanna be able to use our calibrated model to you know, confirm that everything is going to work as we hope. And the same thing with uh, Victoria Village. I know there's a lot of other projects, uh, the pole yard possibly happening and possible additions to our water treatment. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Any other comments from the board? We did, um, Trustee Quinn did send in an email um, and I'm gonna read um, what he's got to say here. Um, as far as um, the study for the water plant proposed by the company we use for referrals, I say we hold off on this decision until a new can, town manager is hired. Any other comments from the board? What, is, what does he mean now? He wants to I, hold off. It's not, it's not my, I'm just reading for word. As, okay. as far as the study for the water plant proposed by a company we use for referrals, I say we hold off on a decision until a new town manager is hired. Um, one thing I will, I'll, I'll address is, um, we are looking at adding additional PRVs. We have a few parts of my system that have pressures that you know aren't exactly optimal for reducing flows or in reducing uh, leakage. Because as pressures go up, more leakage happens in the system. And additionally, there's parts of town that are using water's uh, sources that were not originally for the use of those subdivisions. And it is approved in the current town budget for the additional PRVs to be built. Uh, my discussions with Merrick, they have concerns about the settings of these PRVs and what effects it might have on the system. Um, so this project is essentially on hold until I can get an engineer to sign off and say that these this project is good to go. And that's part of the reason why I'm pushing for this at the beginning of the year, because these it, concerns have been raised. And unless we can get the PRVs, you know, 
approved in the next few months that it'll probably be pushed off to the next year budget. Are you comfortable working with Merrick? Yes, I have actually, they seem very uh, knowledgeable and very open to uh, my concerns. Okay. Hey, any further discussion or motion? Well, yeah, <clears throat> I don't see any reason to wait. This is budgeted money already, right? You budgeted right. the money for this year. I would <clears throat> make a motion to approve that resolution. What is it? 2023-02-01? Yes. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. <clears throat> Next is Construction Guarantee Agreement, Fraser Middle Park Health Center, and Ed will be um, leading this. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Vandenell. Uh, and board. Uh, this is a continuation of the presentation I made in January the 4th. Uh, we had had communications with Middle Park Health uh, to cover the construction guarantee and they made a request to me to waive the surety requirement uh, since uh, I viewed them as a governmental entity. Um, I was open to that idea and I presented that to the Board of Trustees on January the, the 4th. Um, the board did not act on that. The board wanted additional information. So in your packet, I included the original construction guarantee that was presented January the 4th. Uh, immediately following that is a, um, as an engineer's uh, cost estimate for the actual cost of those public improvements. Uh, the surety amount is approximately $2.4 million. Um, and so the question is, uh, that was brought to me was, uh, uh, the board wanted to know more about what those actual construction cost estimates were. So I wanted to provide that. Uh, we also have representatives from uh, Metal Park Health here in the audience. This is Jody Docheff. Um, it works with Metal Park Health and uh, uh, she'd like to speak and maybe you can introduce your, your other team members here as well. Sure. Thank you. My second appearance. I'm Jody Docheff, board chair for Metal Park Health of the Kremlin Memorial Hospital District. I bring with me today, I have Ray Kendrick, he is our director of operations, and so he will help oversee the construction projects that we have. He was also primary on our previous construction projects that we just completed with the build of the brand new hospital in Kremlin and then the expansion that we did in our Granby facility. And then I have Becca, she is the director in our finance department and analyst. And so she's been integral with helping us with getting all the numbers and the analytics together to work with the financing and the logistics of cost, trying to work through the COVID era where all of our supplies, you know, that it was an ever changing target. So I brought them with me in case you had any extra questions that I might not be able to answer, but they should be able to support whatever I have to say for the questions. And so our, our ask was if we could waive the fees for our project here in Fraser. We're very excited. We, re, we are in the financing process right now. We're hoping to have it completed by next week. We'll see. You know, it, it comes and it goes. We will have all together as an all in on this project. It'll be right around $31 million that we'll have invested in this. You know, $2 million are going to be the items that you guys were concerned about, which would be the um, the earthwork, the paving, the utilities, you know, those kinds of things that you want to make sure that are completed. We won't be addressing any of those until once the finance has been completed and we're ready to move. But our goal is to start breaking ground this spring. We are very excited to keep moving forward. We'd like to feel that, you know, our presence and the work that we've done in the past with our other construction projects will kind of give you some comfort that, you know, we plan a project, it's our strategic plan, we stick with the plan, we stick with the budget and our time frame, and then we want to, because we want to be good neighbors with the community. We feel that this is going to be a huge, huge asset to the community on this side of the county. When you don't have to drive Fraser Flats in the winter, you know, during the windy times and everything like that, that would be really, really helpful for those where transportation might be a problem for them. And are there any questions I can try to answer for you? I can say that we've already invested almost $8 million at this point. You know, we have 4 million and then we'll have another some in bonds and things through the financing. So we have made significant investment in this already, which might give you, you know, more reassurance as well that we will be completing the project. 
on time and with the intentions, good intentions. So both other projects at Kremlin and Granby were both on time and in budget? Well, yeah, we are a little bit over budget, but not much, but they were on time. And what's the cost to the facility for the surety? It'd be about $2.4 million. But, that, but you're not, not the, paying that. Oh. That's what the question is now. We're right. going to waive it, right? right? Well, no. Right, but- Well, the so surety's for 2.4. But it's a portion of that. It's, it's, like it, it's a percentage of what the two, you know, so, so, so the items you guys are concerned about are going to be about $2 million. And so if, say we do 100, 125%, you know, the surety about, I believe of like right around 2.3 or so. Right, but the that. premium. What's your cost for that? We just have to get a letter of credit, right? That's mm -hmm. well, we would have to hold that, you know, that'd be part of it'd be restricted within our construction budget. To do that, we'd have to hold that to the side for us. And so you don't even have a premium for that. I don't know that number, and I apologize. I don't have the number of that off the top of my head, but I can probably have that for you by before I leave today. Because I think that's what we were asking last time. Okay, I can get that number for you, and I'll have that for you before we leave. Are there any other yeah. comments or concerns I can address yeah. for you? Um, so it doesn't quite work. Like once we leave an item on the agenda, mm -hmm. we're not going to go back to that item. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you can get that number, uh, that would be great. Uh, otherwise. We could, could table it to the end of the meeting. We could table it if you guys want to stick around for the next three or four, three hours. Oh. Yeah, I don't mind. So, I don't mind hanging around so you have that specific information because I do believe it's hard to make a decision unless you know what's going to cost. You know right. those kinds of things. So I totally appreciate that, and I apologize for not having that number. And what I'll do, I'll work on that immediately for you. Okay. And then, um, so we can have a motion to. Table until the end. Table it to, um, after. Um... I think the motion, uh, Mayor, would be to uh, continue this item and move it to the end of the agenda. Well, I don't want to do that because I don't want it to sit here for executive session. Oh, no, so, no, no. They, um, they, so let's, they, so let's move it to um, after support for US 40. Okay. If I can have that motion, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I'd, I'd like to know what it would be without the contingency for the contractors also. So based on two different numbers, the number you gave us, and then if we took the con contingency off, what it would be. Okay, I'll find those out. And thank you for your consideration and letting us yeah. get this information back for you. Okay. Any further discussion? You, You're welcome. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we are now at resolution 2023-0202, Victoria Village Agreement, and Michael will be leading this discussion. Yeah, so uh, good evening, town board of trustees. Um, um, what we have before you tonight is a contract for services uh, to include the master planning process and the pre-construction work that we've done. Uh, we've had, uh, we did hire our attorney, Kendra Carberry, uh, to represent the town and to look at the contract. And we were able to negotiate um, a good contract. She was able to vet a few things, make sure the liability was there to protect the town's interest. And uh, and uh, we provided a not to exceed number in there for $762,000, uh, 715 cents, sorry, $762,715 for this work. Uh, includes, you know, engineering, design, uh, architectural, um, get us to the point where we're ready to break ground, basically. Um, uh, we were, you know, there's there's good liability. There's a general liability insurance written in for $1 million. Professional liability insurance, $2 million, uh, plus $3 million as an umbrella policy for this. And that's mainly regarding the construction plans that are going to be created for Victoria Village based on the master plan. Um, Essentially, you want that coverage in the event that any of the construction plans um, are faulty. You want to be able to have the insurance there to protect the town and protect the development. So that's what that's there for. Um, and um, yeah, this agreement is right here before you. Uh, Kendra did a fantastic job. 
She, uh, she regretted not being able to be available. She is available at seven. If there are any questions that the board has, she can be available tonight starting at seven o'clock. Um, and otherwise I'll hand it off to Todd. Um, who is that? I'm sorry, Ken Kendra? Kendra Carberry. So we reached out to about four law firms that specialize in land use and affordable housing contracts, uh, subdivision improvement agreements, programming and development. Um, She's very well, uh, Kendra is very well um, kind of renowned in this in this sector. Uh, she developed a lot of the programs for bail, their affordable housing projects and programming contract services. Uh, we even mirrored a lot of the language from the deed restriction and bail in our own Frazier deed restriction that she wrote, which she was part of. And she knows exactly what to look for. She did a good job with it. And we were able to reach an agreement on a Monday and have this contract for you tonight for, for your consideration. Okay, that was my question of whether or not our attorney has reviewed this in depth. Yes. Because this is a lot of legalese that I'm not familiar with. But okay. So the main things that I just kind of covered were the things that she kind of altered in the contract. It's really just a, a not to exceed number, uh, protect the town from uh, you know the liability for the potential of any kind of faulty construction. I'm not saying that they're going to be, but you want to be be careful in these types of situations. And um, she. Yeah. Knew what to look for. She provided some feedback to me, um, and we were able to negotiate a good contract with Todd and his team. And um, happy to answer any questions that you may have about it. Was there any back and forth, or did you guys just like the contract? No, there was back and forth. I think at the end of the day, we may have been less comfortable with it than than Kendra and, and staff, but uh, there was back and forth with it, and um, I think we were able to iron it out. Um, you know, mutually satisfactory to both the town and to Mountain Affordable. Okay. And again, this is just for the, the master to cover the master planning process, everything up to the pre-construction point. Uh, Resubdividing uh, design work for utilities, horizontal infrastructure, and then uh, I kind of hand it to Todd if you want to kind of cover the rest of what you guys would be included in that work. Sure. Um, so I'm Todd Moore with Mountain Affordable Housing Development, and this is my partner, Matt Ginsburg. Um, so, you know, as we see it, the, the contract does cover the scope of services through um, the point we're ready to break ground. Um, this first component does provide for uh, master planning and conceptual design that goes along with master planning. Um, so that way, when we have the master plan complete and ready for approval, hopefully the first um, Board of Trustees meeting in May that uh, we will then commence with uh, design development for the first phase. We will also be preparing a phasing plan that shows based on the master plan, what buildings that we have um, for design based on site yield. And uh, we will have those elevated um, as we go through the master planning process so that we have you know, floor plan renderings, elevations, um, color drawings that we will be presenting to the, the town and the community as we go through the process and we'll be soliciting feedback from them. But, um, you know, the, the detailed design work starts after that. Um, and so we've, we've prepared a schedule to kind of walk through the sequence of activities that we envision between now and um, groundbreaking, including um, financing applications to get LIHTC financing. And, um, and working with the town on grants. So um, we have sketched that out in a bar chart that we're happy to talk to you about and show you what some of the, the sequences of the work and the key dates that we're targeting on. Um, if that would be of interest, we're happy to do that. Um, we have, we, we hope to have um, Vogel and Associates on the line to kind of walk through and be able to answer questions about master planning and community engagement and how we will be soliciting input and factoring that into the master plan. But um, he thinks that he's online, but apparently he's not in the same waiting room that, oh. that the meeting is in. So uh -oh. um, I don't I'll know if he's been able to. No wonder nobody's joining us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if there's others as well, but um, if you want to just pause for a minute, then we can. Um, see if that works. Yeah, I can't get in either. What? There's something wrong with this Zoom. 
dead thing in the air. I can probably stop it on the side. Are you online? Oh, okay. I mean, I'm online, but I'm just. Uh, uh, <laughs> Miss the old days. The packets. So the ID, the meeting ID, does not match what's on our. Does not match. Yeah. We have two five nine zero four zero eight zero one three on the agenda. Probably why no one jumped in for right. public comment. Anyway. We, we, we know there was someone that was going to. Yeah. Well, Jody's relieved. Oh, yeah, I think she, she gets the next time. So, yeah. so yeah. We'll, what we'll do is we'll we'll stop well, this and we'll be able to um, uh, tie these together with the recording. We're not sure what happened there, but. Uh, We'll go in in this meeting and we'll restart we'll okay. a. Yes, I do. Are you? Um, so I just want to make the board aware that we're going to have to go back to um, open forum because of the technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, we just happened so. Um, We'll do that after this presentation. I think we'll have I think we can build the agenda <laughs> The best laid plans are those for changing. No. <laughs> So we'd just like to apologize to everybody who just joined the meeting uh, online. We had a faulty number with the previous Zoom link and started the meeting already. Um, that that recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, that will be posted after this meeting. Uh, we apologize for the confusion. And uh, as the mayor said, we will be uh, pro providing the the opportunity for open forum for anyone who wanted to provide some input to the board uh, for items not on the agenda. Um, apologize for that. So yeah, we've already started the meeting, obviously, and we're um, we're at um, right now we're at uh, resolution twenty twenty three zero two zero two Victoria Village Agreement. Um, we're going to, going to be having some input from um, from uh, Mountain Affordable Housing, and um, and then I'm going to suggest that we put um, the open forum. I'm going to suggest that we put the open forum right after this the topic that we're discussing right now. Um, I don't know if we need a motion for that, but that's what's going to happen. So. Um, we do apologize to those online, but we will get you back in here for the open forum here in a second. Well, minutes here. That's it. We're being hacked. I can tell. <laughs> Somebody's messing with us. Okay. Okay, Todd, do you want to um, go ahead and continue? Yes, thank you. Uh, Michael, if we could please have you pull up the, the schedule for us. We'll uh, we'd like to walk you through that just so you can see what we have planned and, and what the sequence is. Um, but most importantly, you know, we have a lot of near term activities that um, start off with with the master planning, because obviously we need to know what the overall plan and program is. So um, this may not be the first time that you've seen this, but we've revised it a little bit based on where we are today. And um, so we've we've. Um, planned and, and scheduled uh, with your concurrence four different workshops for the um, for the master plan. The first three are more um, open houses and, and interactive. Uh, we've planned those on 
February 22nd, March 15th, April 13th, and then finally on May 17th, um, with the goal of the, the May 17th um, being conducted concurrently with the Board of Trustees meeting so that at the end of that, we'll be seeking approval of the master plan. And so, um, so that really gives us four, op four opportunities for that interaction. Um, we anticipate that the open houses and workshops would run from about uh, four o'clock to 5.30 on the days that we've indicated. Uh, we plan to advertise those um, widely. We'd like to put them in the Sky High News. We'd like to post them on the town's website and uh, also create other um, notifications so that we can garner input there. And we really wanna be able to maximize participation. That'll be important for us. Um, and when I get through kind of walking through the schedule, you know, Jeff will share what that, what that looks like in terms of um, initial project initiation all the way through final visioning and, and the established master plan. Um, so in parallel with that, you know, we've already started during the month of January um, working with, with the, the town management staff and town finance to assist with grant strategies and grant amounts to maximize our opportunities there. Those are currently in the works. Um, Matt will be able to provide us an update if there's any questions on that, but that has already been underway. Um, I think the other thing is that we intend to wrap that up roughly in May, um, as you can see here. And then um, we'll follow that in August by um, pulling together an application package for 9% federal LIHTC financing. Um, so that is our goal. That's what we're going to be targeting. Uh, we originally thought we might um, go for the August application for 4%, but um, you know, looking at everything that we had to do, that was probably more ambitious than it was realistic uh, based on where we are today. And so uh, we will start with the 9%. And, uh, and move forward from there. Um, we will proceed, proceed with a subsequent round of public financing in August of next year. Um, also, what we have currently coming up is um, in February through May, we will start to do uh, site assessment, including uh, wetland delineations. There's already been one, I believe that's been done but we need to validate what the limits are so that we know what the boundaries are for disturbance and non-disturbance. Um, but we'll be kicking that off roughly May, excuse me, February 16th. And uh, I think the town is planning to engage an environmental consultant to do um, some well monitoring, not as in well water, but just checking the uh, groundwater levels. Um, we also will be looking to update the needs assessment. As you know, for affordable housing, the county has put together a needs assessment. Um, we want to make sure that the assumptions that are in there are still valid. So we'll be updating that in support of our February application for LIHTC financing. Um, we will also be doing a parking study during that to make sure that um, one of the things that we want to talk to the town about is, is um, parking regulations and what we're required for in our uh, preliminary, preliminary conceptual plan that was presented um, to the town in December, maybe, oh, maybe November. Um, we, you know, we had assumed that the parking requirements would be as currently stated um, in town code, but um, we know there's been some requests to evaluate, well, what if we um, add a fourth story and, and get additional units that we can uh, put in in Victoria Village. Obviously, that comes with the demand for more parking. So um, you know, we want to do that and uh, and assess what those needs are based on additional <laughs> units. Um, May through June, we'll also be doing um, geotechnical investigation and looking what the soil's composition is and what they can support in terms of um, loading and, and foundation recommendations. Um, and then we will look to start surveying after that and, um, and civil engineering as well, which would be roughly May through July. Um, and right now we're looking to do site preparation starting in August and uh, begin relocating utilities based on the, the final 
master plan and move forward from there. Um, Jeff, if you're online and can hear me, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes and talking about the, the master planning process and approach for community engagement. Yes, um, good evening, um, Jeff Vogel. Um, just uh, as, as Todd indicated, you know, our next steps is really to initiate the master planning process and um, the process would coincide with the, um, the four workshops um, that we have um, outlined on the schedule. And the first being really the project initiation and orientation. So that, that workshop would involve um, really discussing the physical attributes of the site, um, kind of going through, um, you know, the opportunities and constraints associated with the property. And then also talking about really what are the bigger ideas um, for the property in terms of housing and recreation and some of those other uses. And and um, you know, we'll have a series of exhibits and outlines to to facilitate discussion with um, folks that attend the open house to get that insights and in and in, um, input. And then from that, um, that information will be synthesized and evaluated. And we'll have a second um, workshop that really kind of refines a little bit more the vision and the program based on what we heard in the first community outreach meeting. Um, workshop. So um, on the visioning programming, again, I'd start to talk about maybe in more detail the type of uses, the type of recreation components, um, kind of um, narrowing down that uh, just a little bit more, but also, again, with that, allowing for additional input and, and insights. And then from that, we would begin to create master plan alternatives. So the alternatives would test and um, illustrate some of the items in terms of programming and vision elements um, with the alternatives. Um, those alternatives would be presented at the third workshop. Um, and again, we may have one, two or three alternatives in which we would um, solicit input um, from, from the stakeholders and, and members. Um, with that um, workshop, again, we would summarize and synthesize that information and. And with each one of these, by the way, as we as we prepare these these, these workshops and, and summaries, we would obviously be meeting with the town of Fraser and staff um, at each level of these, just to share the information, discuss it, and 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 evaluate next steps. And then, out of the alternatives, or maybe a hybrid of the alternatives, um, or even a fourth alternative, in which that would um, inform what would become a final master plan and visioning document. Um, that would get a, be uh, presented um, at a workshop just to kind of illustrate, you know, what, where did we end up programming wise and character and all those other considerations. And then that would, um, that final master plan would serve as a basis for beginning to prepare entitlement and plat documents um, as required to, to move this forward. So that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the an overall of, of of the master planning process, and I can't you know stress enough. It's really going to be an iterative process with staff and also with you know community residents and stakeholders. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so just kind of to, to wrap up, you know, in terms of sequence and duration of activities, um, I didn't touch on the entitlements, but. If you if you were to look at the bar chart that we have up on the screen, you can see that we have about five months in there for planning and entitlements. Um, it, we think it's a reasonable duration for that. And uh, uh, with that going as planned, we should have our final plans and everything approved by um, the end of September. And so, you know, that's really what we need ultimately to, to start with building permits and, and start moving dirt on the site. So, um, you know, that's that's really part of the critical path that's that's driving all of this. So um, we'll stay focused on that and make sure things stay on track. Um, but happy to answer any other questions. Or seems like a good plan. Yeah, it's good progress. Mm -hmm. So we, obviously, we we are happy to work with um, the town and staff accordingly as we go through this. Um, 
you know, there's been some discussion whether the town might want to set up a subcommittee to work with us through master planning and, and conceptual design. Um, we're certainly open to that. If you want to tell us who we'd like to meet with, that would be great. <laughs> Isn't that the planning commission that would be doing that? No? That's not the scope of the planning commission. They shouldn't be involved. But... So it'll be community meetings. Those first firm meetings are community meetings, and they're not scheduled at the same time as our board meeting as a workshop. The, they're the, separate workshops. Yes, the first three are. Okay. Um, and then the last one would be um, on the record. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Because I think that's a requirement that um, at least one of the, the open houses and workshops needs to be in a formal setting. Or, uh, we'll have a public hearing that last one just to okay. make sure um, and provide some opportunities for the community to provide input on the final design or the final two designs or hopefully it's just one final design that we're looking at yeah <clears throat> so uh that'll meet our grant requirements for victoria village for that acquisition and i'm not sure if it was said before but uh we do have the church available for these open houses just having the extra space there's a presentation involved to go over like uh, Todd was talking about the characteristics of the site, limitations. Um, you know, you have additional seating there, and uh, and it doesn't conflict with any of our our public meetings or planning commission meetings. If there is an advantage to bring to using our AV system for one of those workshops, we have the flexibility to do that. Otherwise, we're we're looking at using the church for these open houses. Okay, great. And we can go old school as well. You know, with with bulletin boards and posters and stuff like that. So. Most of us are old school anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pre zoom time, it's a much better time. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's awesome. Okay, anybody else have a comment? Okay, I'm gonna open this up to the public. See if we have any public comment, we're gonna start here in um, the building. So if any, any of the public would like yeah. to. No. We're still taking comments and discussion. Oh, okay. So um, anybody here in the building? And it's gonna be the same roles, three minutes. Um, not seeing any hands here. Anybody? Yep, go ahead and come up, state your name. And if you live in the town, I'm... Hi, Megan Luther, resident of Frazier. I just wondered with that agreement, Todd, you had mentioned there was some stuff that you think you can work with, like that's maybe not necessarily what you guys wanted. And I was wondering what those things might have been that the lawyers pushed through and how they would affect the town itself and the project. Like, is it was it detrimental? Did you have to give up more than you wanted to? Or was it a good, like, is it okay? Like, can we work with it? So that would be my question. Thank you. Uh, yes, we can work with it. Um, but I think the primary changes were, were one as it relates to um, moving forward and having the right to um, suspend or terminate the project, um, which is, you know, obviously the town's going to have that right. So um, council wanted to make sure that it was explicit in the agreement. Um, we did modify the limits of our uh, various insurance policies to um, accommodate the request of the town. So those increased generally by one to two million um, mm -hmm. for the different policies. Um, and I think that the last one was a was a modification to the limitation of liability that tied that into the extent of the um, prevailing insurance policies. But those are probably the big three. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Good Thank question. You. Okay, it looks like we have one hand up, and this is specific to um, the item that we're talking about, um, which is um, Victoria Village agreement. So, Deborah Shulman, you have three minutes. Ashley, my comment wasn't specific to the Victoria Village. Are we going to have public comment on general topics? Yeah, so we, um, yeah, so we had a technical difficulty, and we will be having uh, open forum after this. So hang on. Okay, so this isn't part of that. So I'm I'm going to wait to the open forum because my what my comment is not yep. okay. related Thank to you. the Victoria Village. Thank, Thank you. you. And I didn't see any other hands up. 
Any further board discussion? No, I'd like to make a motion Thank to you. approve resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. You're getting so fast. <laughs> Good. The approved resolution 2023-02-02 for the Victoria Village Master Plan Agreement. Okay, is there a... Uh, I'll second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, we did have technical difficulties at the beginning of this, and we did already have open forum, but um, the, the Zoom link was incorrect. So we're going to open this back up to uh, open comment and uh, open forum. And to, to be clear, you have three minutes only. Um, we will cut um, cut it off at three minutes. You need to state your name and if you live in the town of Frazier or not. So if you can digitally raise your hand, we, we know Deborah's up. So. Yeah, so if I could go, I, I, I lost the raise hand thing. Um, so am I uh, good to go in my comment? Yep, you are ready to go, thank you. Okay, good, I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, in 2016, when we put down the deposit in our dream home, located on Cozen's Meadow Conservation Easement open space, we had no idea that the developer was planning to develop the meadow or that we were buying into a metropolitan district. Up until summer of 2022, the developer endeavored to keep the Metropolitan District secret. There was no disclosure of the district in our contract, nor about the taxes. For over a decade, he and his wife were the only directors on the five director resident board. So there was lack of accountability and debt and spending. There were no elections. Elections are important. It is how we keep these districts accountable to the taxpayer. But there were no email notifications of residents and property owners of meetings and elections as mandated for the metropolitan districts formed after January 1st, 2000. Yet again, Spencer Fain, the law firm that is the administrator of the three districts has failed to meet the 150 day deadline for email notification regarding procedures for, for the election that occur in May. This is the same law firm that wrote to the county and objected to the unsolicited applicants for the board. It is a clear conflict of interest if the law firm administering a metropolitan district is also representing the developer. Metropolitan districts are meant to keep home prices down. Instead, due to rampant abuse of metropolitan districts statewide, home prices and taxes are dramatically increased. In Castle Rock, the magic of compound interest has ballooned debt to over a billion dollars. We are only supposed to pay for the public improvements within our district, but the way our districts are structured, all debt and revenue goes to the poster stamp district with no residents. The developer has proposed amendments to the 2005 service plan that would create numerous districts. Then he can play a shell game with debt and revenue, increasing our debt, our interest rates, and ultimately our taxes, and force us to be responsible for bonds to fund future developments. I ask that no amendments to the 2005 service plan are considered until there is a full accounting of the debt, interest, and taxes for the West Meadow Metropolitan District. We are not rich. We bought when prices were considerably lower. We're saving for retirement that will come sooner than expected for health reasons. We cannot afford excessive taxation. I am here because the town of Fraser approved our Metro districts along with the 2005 service plan. So there is some responsibility to us, the property owners by the town of Frazier to make sure that the rules and regulations of the special district act are adhered to. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you, Deborah. Okay, are there any other um, public comments from online? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on. Does the hospital have our answer? You guys wanna go ahead and come up and... Um... Thank you, Jody Docheff, Middle Park Health. Thank you for allowing us the additional time so we can get some information for you. So what we have found is that the assurity bond, the premium will be one to 2% of the amount of the bond. So being 2.3, it's gonna be 26 
or excuse me, 23 to $46,000. I don't have the firm whether it'll be one or 2% at this time, but the minimum amount would be the $23,000 that we would be asking to waive up to the $46,000. Um, as far as how the bond works for us, it's not just a letter of credit. What happens is that $2.3 million is reserved out of our financing and our construction account, and that's held to the side. So we cannot use that until the project is completely finished and then it's released. So we would not be able to use those funds to apply it to the items that you guys are asking us to complete at that time. And so that's where that concern comes in. So the way, the only way we can mitigate that would be, you know, asking for additional financing from our lenders or seeing if there's a way to come up with some additional cash. So it's not your traditional letter of credit. It does affect the cash that we can use in our construction account. Thank you. Wouldn't, wouldn't it just be released when those components of the construction are completed? Right. But we would need to use that money in order to initiate, you know, because we have we have to put funds down, you know, for people to start the project. And so it just wouldn't be available. And so, you know, the workaround would be to just ask for additional funding, you know, which is an option, you know, we can ask for that as well. But we we're just kind of hoping, you know, for cooperation with the town. And as far as contingency, you're asking about the contingencies that we have. So our um, con contractor is has a contingency of one and a quarter million and Middle Park Health has a contingency of one and a quarter million. So if something were to happen, there would still be the funds in the contingency account to cover the cost of the infrastructure and the items that you guys are concerned. Okay. So I feel like the with the... Um... CGA is that contingency agreement that mm -hmm. was it's short for covers us in case the there is a default requires reimbursement from the developer. So um, in the spirit of getting this ball rolling and helping them out because it's going to be a huge amenity, um, I would like to make a motion to approve resolution 202-20602. That the right number this was on my agenda no nope. what's the resolution number now let's get in here okay no that that was a pc resolution that was used to supplement oh, okay so this is this is to approve a construction guarantee agreement okay. and the board's decision whether to waive the the fees specific to the surety and yeah, you're making it tricky. Can, can okay, you go I would over like that to make motion to document. approve. Has that been reviewed by our attorney? And yes, it has. Where is the contingency? Where are the contingency funds? And I don't see well, the contingency funds are not listed in the construction guarantee agreement. Construction guarantee agreement comes out of our our municipal code. Uh, we have two agreements for construction. One is in the subdivision improvement agreement. This is not a subdivision improvement. Uh, this is a uh, particular one building, essentially. Uh, under those circumstances, we use a construction guarantee agreement. We did run this by uh, Kent Whitmer. Uh, the language was modified slightly in the construction guarantee agreement in consideration of the waiving of fees. Uh, but yes, this has, has Kent's blessing. Our, uh attorneys online is that Whitmer? i can't tell it looks like whitmer that's oh, there there's Ken. can you hear us hi can you guys hear me yeah great yeah so i did rework the uh, boilerplate template for the construction guarantee surety agreement uh, to remove the requirement for surety in this case at the request of Ed. Um, so basically, trustees, if there were a default in this situation, if you were to approve this arrangement, then you would have to look to the hospital to um, enforce that agreement and, and make sure that the improvements are put in instead of looking to a deposited um, surety amount or letter of credit and just doing it on the town's own if that makes sense so what you're giving up is 
um, kind of absolute certainty that it would get done. But in light of the fact that we're talking about a government entity and they're fully um, approved for the funding of the entire project, um, it's probably a pretty minimal risk. And I'll also point out that the construction guarantee agreement, uh, when it typically calls for surety, it also has provisions in there that in the case of default, you draw on the surety to complete the construction, the town would do that. Um, but there's provisions in there that say that if, it, uh, if it's above that, if the construction cost to complete it is higher than the surety, you can continue to work, but then you build the, um, the applicant here, which in this case would be Metal Park Health. And that language is still in the agreement. <coughs> I mean, I guess I'm still a little uncomfortable with the resolution that was passed by the Planning Commission last June recommended that there be appropriate security or well, construction guarantee and then security. And the town has made a mistake before on this issue, right? Not well, that I feel I'm like aware. our attorneys addressed it in the construction guarantee agreement with the modifications that he made. He took out, and he I, took out the surety. Took yeah, it out. right. So that's not. That's, that's well, not okay. That's actually doing away with. But uh, okay. Well, <clears throat> I think we still have it covered. Personally, yeah. I'm personally all for sureties, but given given this is a government entity and a hospital that we are very excited to get, um, I think it's probably safe to to say that we can go without a surety on this one. Okay, anybody else? You know, sureties are a kind of a button for us, so that's why we're hesitant. Right. Yeah. No, I totally appreciate that. You know, we all learn from our lessons from the past. And, you know, but I do love hearing the vote of confidence because we're here to support the community and we're here to be here. We are a healthcare system throughout the entire county. We have five clinics and two hospitals in this county, not including our project that we're going to have here in Frazier. So, you know, we're very committed to the people of the entirety of Grand County and Jackson County as we support Walden as well. You know, so we appreciate, you know, the faith that you have in us and we do look forward to being good neighbors and have a great cooperation and a symbiotic relationship so everybody can benefit from this building going forward. My life was definitely saved in March and maybe, well, definitely if the hospital would have been on the side of the county, I could have gotten to ER, OR faster. So I, yeah, I really want to hear. So I would like to point out one other, one other aspect of this, of this hospital that's being built. Uh, there's been a lot of communications over the past year and a half between the managers uh, uh, Winter Park, myself, Granby, and uh, Middle Park Health, uh, part of our broadband initiative uh, that started with Northwest COG uh, to extend broadband into this part of Grand County. Uh, we worked on an agreement uh, so that the medical center would include space for what they call a meet me center. So the broadband would then come into that and, and then you could do your, what they call the last mile of uh, connectivity for broadband uh, and that benefits not patients, it benefits everybody, businesses, residents, and so forth as well. So there is an aspect of, of community uh, uh, giving back that the hospital is, uh, is planning with this construction. I don't think there's any disagreement that the hospital is a positive aspect. Mm -hmm. It's just our sensitivity for surety agreement when we've said we've nev we're never going to do this again. That. Never say never. <laughs> At least I don't. I mean, I think it's a great asset for the community. I just, I'd like, maybe it's not time or place to talk about, you know, what your commitment is to providing care for uninsured or uh, people that are challenged with, um, challenged financially to support citizens. The community here probably has the highest rate of paying customers insured clients and that's good for you guys right you're going to your revenue will be strong in this community so it's mutually beneficial but what is what is a hospital's commitment to providing care to people that 
you know, struggle financially, can't afford co-pays or deduct deductibles or don't have insurance? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great question. So, you know, we are committed to helping the community. And so, as you're right, you know, our payer mix of insurance, you know, which is commercial insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, those kinds of things, our payer mix is really, it's really exceptional, you know, with about 46% of our payer mix being commercial insurance. Where that makes a difference is the reimbursement amount. So, commercial insurance reimburses us, you know, per contract, per visit, in, in a higher rate than Medicare or Medicaid. And so what we also have is we do have our charity care programs, and then we work really closely with the county and the Grand Foundation, so people are not going to be turned away because they don't have the means. There is a process that they have to follow. Um, there's paperwork they have to do, so it, it's, it's an earned process. You don't just to come in and just say, well, you know, this is my thing, because we do have to report a lot of this out to the state, but, you know, if we, there's a lot of money every year that we put through and we just forgive to people. And then we don't necessarily talk about it. Maybe we should talk about it more, but anybody who calls and asks for help, we can do that. And there is new legislation now too, where you know we don't bill for 45 days. We don't even send out a bill for 45 days where people have the opportunity to contact us and ask for help and we can get them connected to the resources that they need. And then, you know, if there's something that comes up and they need a discount, you know, for cash pricing or something like that, even if they do have an insurance, you know, we're able to do that. Because what we found with the insurance exchanges in Obamacare is everybody had insurance, but no one could still afford, you know, all of the co-pays and deductibles. Because most people chose, you know, the copper plan, which had, you know, a 10, 15, sometimes $20,000 deductible, where if you had to go to the ER, it goes to your deductible, you know, so it wasn't a hugely successful venture for, you know, help people with cash flow. But yeah, we are totally involved with the community and we have state programs. Our CEO is really, really involved with um, the Colorado Hospital Association, as well as other CEOs in rural areas to get programs and things together to help out our community. Because we are still considered rural where we're at. It's a big, you know, we have a lot of people here, you know, we have the tourist towns, you know, but we still have a lot of rural people here as well. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about that in the future. Sure. I mean, you can't turn people away from the ER. That's in tallow rules and you can't no. do that. But, you know, people that get caught up in the system and then, you know, generate huge bills and can't pay it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to understand how, you know, what your commitment is to our community in terms of helping people that are financially sure. struggling. And a lot of that's going to be education as well. There is a stigma, you know, to there's it. You have it takes a little you have to be vulnerable to let people know that you need help. And sometimes, you know, that's the hardest part people have to get over coming through and then asking for the help, you know, don't wait as long as you need get, let's get up in front of it. You know, there's the Colorado indigent care program, which is, you know, they base it upon your income and then you have a copay that you pay for, you know, whether it's a ER visit, those kinds of things. So there are resources out there. I think a lot of it is education. So people know as well as, you know, maybe trying to address, you know, some of the stigma. It's like, there's no shame in coming and asking for help because we're here to help you. You're our friends and neighbors, which is fortunate for being a small community because, you know, we are all friends and neighbors. We pretty much know each other here, which is a nice advantage. Great. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Any further board comments? Okay, I think we... Can you rephrase your question? I will re rephrase <laughs> my, um, let's see, I'll get back in here. So Katie, actually. there's not a resolution to approve Yeah, it's this. not, it's a so motion. I would like to make a motion to authorize the Fraser Mayor to sign the construction guarantee agreement with the, uh, um, for the Fraser Middle Park Health Center. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Two nays. Five Thank you. We look forward to having you guys come out at the building site and see okay. as at all the different stages. It'll yeah. be exciting for us. I'm a, I'm a yay. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys um, don't, don't have to stick it. We'd love to have you stick around, but don't feel obligated to. <laughs> to, to stick around. So. Where are we at? Baseline. So we are now at late baseline planning services cost review, and this is Rob. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Hello, board and trustees. Um, before you is a, a memo um, outlining some of the questions and concerns that were brought up at the last meeting. Okay. And a little bit of background on the contract to address those questions. Um, and what was proposed is basically four distinct alternatives because they cause different triggers along the way. Um, uh, the first one being you can maintain the status quo that we've budgeted for with baseline this year um, and focus on uh, transparency and cost saving measures with them. Uh, you, we can initiate a hiring process for an internal town planner, but provide overlapping services with baseline until that planner is ready to operate. Um, we can, with 30 days notice, terminate a baseline engineering uh, agreement and basically not have planning. Um, so we'd probably um, pass an ordinance that would terminate planning for whatever time period until we had someone up and running. Um, and the last one would be to just abandon planning services um, from the town standpoint. The last two are not real alternatives. They are within the ordinance framework, um, but they they increase liability dramatically. They're just really not good solutions for anybody. Um, so the recommendation is to pursue one or two as far as the options. Um, and the challenge for the board would be uh, option one does not have anything defined or would not trigger anything uh, from a budget standpoint. Option two of hiring a planner, uh, it's not in the budget. So it would require a budget amendment to allocate those funds and increase our staffing budget to fill that void. And if you would like any more clarification or guidance on any of these, I can go back and pull that stuff up. But that, was, that kind of was the first simple step of which, which path would y'all like to pursue? Okay, board comments? I'm in favor of number two. I'm in favor of number two. What is, I, what is the construction community thought of <laughs> using baseline? I think you missed our last you meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, on your location. I, I thought happy. we. It's very frustrating. To get well, it was a select group of people that were negative. When they I, make a phone call I thought we talked about having some. Um, face to face with baseline and having maybe coming up with a corrective action plan if there you know deficiencies we've identified or their problems and give them an opportunity to address those before we pull the plug on the whole program i think option two allows that um there has been initial uh conversations um Ed initiated those with baseline to um really pay attention to some of the dupl uh, duplicative charges that were causing a lot of um uh ranker uh and so i think that will be ongoing um this is basically baseline is still our planner until we have another planner in place um Number i will two say it's basically saying we're going to hire a town planner yep that's different than what you just said uh, maybe i can add a little, little sure. clarity um uh, you know when we when catherine resigned uh last april i believe it was uh we had to have planner in place and I reached out to baseline we brought the contract to the board uh, we approved that my my discussion with the board at the time was let's give them six months and see how this looks um, in the six months that we've had there I admit there's been issues a lot of issues most recently I got a call this past Friday uh, from baseline because they failed to issue the press release for the special meeting that we had been working on for a month and a half for February the 8th. And I don't normally get mad, but I got mad at that one. And for me, that was kind of the culmination of a lot of errors that, that we've seen. And we've had a lot of conversations with, with Ben and I have had conversations about how to reduce costs. We have received uh, some concessions uh, to, to reduce those administrative costs. We've reduced the amount of people that are showing up at, at board meetings because they're you know, each one of those are getting an hourly fee. Um, there's a lot of issues in our code that gives the town manager some flexibilities and then it gives town staff some flexibilities there. We lost a lot of continuity with, with uh, Catherine uh, being gone. So some of that continuity and some of those, uh, those approvals and so forth, uh, my 
personal view has been that you know our code needs to be real clear about about what is required and what's not required. And a lot of the issues that have come up have been just disagreements between developers and and the town. Uh, for example, people wanting to bypass certain steps of the system. We go back and forth, you know, and it's and it becomes a long debate. And then baseline or Merrick may get involved and cost go up. Uh, and I've always encouraged uh, staff and baseline to follow the code. But quite frankly, this is this is a to me it's a it's a municipal priority of what is what is what is that value that the town wants to uphold in our in our land development uh, procedures? You know, we had a, a town planner for a long time. Uh, baseline was a good intermediate step to get us through a rough period. Uh, but if the town is says we, you know, having an internal planner is is what we feel is is most valuable for us as a community, is most valuable to our our businesses, our development community, and the local public. Uh, I need to hear that, and we'll. Uh, we're already drafting uh, a job notice for a town planner if that's the way the board wants to go on this. Uh, but either way, I think option two would be my recommendation. Uh, understanding that there will be a probably a three to four month lag between starting that action and getting somebody hired, if we can even find somebody. And then on top of that, there's probably a good eight to 16 months of, of transition and overlap, just from our experience with, with a new planner coming in midstream and taking on new projects. Uh, that did cause a lot of confusion uh, early on, but uh, you know, it's whatever the board would like to do. So do you see our new project manager being able to assist a new planner when, they, when we get them? and backing up on some of the details? Or are they, are they going to be just on the ground, specific projects? Well, what, our, they get done? what our project manager is doing, Monica, uh, is ironing out some of those procedures, not just with, uh, uh, with capital projects, but also with the development project as well. Uh, making sure that the coordination and timelines are being met. Uh, but we also have a lot of unknowns. I mean, we get emails back and forth all day long, simply between us and the and the building department in Winter Park, uh, back and forth emails about about things like building permits. And you know, Monica's done a great job of helping to standardize that. She's also compiled a, a list, two or three pages of, of recommended code uh, changes okay. that we need to do that help us to streamline this procedure easier and okay. to standardize those procedures. Um, it has not been easy. Uh, because the building department in Winter Park sometimes can be a little difficult to work with. Um, but we're making progress. We have a meeting on February the 15th. Uh, Monica will be in town. We're going to sit down with the Winter Park staff, town staff, to kind of address some of these lingering hiccups in the procedures. Um, we're, I think we're learning from our mistakes with, uh, with Baseline. I think Baseline is learning from their mistakes as well. But... Um, you know, missing this deadline. I mean, I we coordinated for a month and a half to make sure we could have a quorum for a special meeting. Yeah. This was on the books. Uh, the applicant himself also put out monies. And it's costing him about five thousand dollars a month, uh, just in, in those holding costs to get this project off the ground. Um, you know, notices were mailed out, and unfortunately, baseline dropped the ball. So, and that's that's unfortunate. It's egg on our face as well. So. Uh, I'm ready to make a change myself. Well, one one option that's not on here is um, it's kind of interesting. The other night, the theme that came out from the town manager applicants was around working with local governments and you know sort of collaborating and stuff. Is there any possibility just to forge some relationship with Winter Park and you know give them money to help? maybe hire somebody else if, or do they have capacity? I mean, that's another I option. Reached, the money may, yeah. may be better spent. One of, one of the bullets, I reached out to James Shockey in the town of Winter Park. They confirmed they do not have capacity and they do not want to adopt any of our planning services. Yeah, they're the home rule and we're statutory. It's different. So it's, it's, know, it's so nightmare. Yeah, I mean, that's trustee Quinn. This is trustee Quinn's. As far as the study of 
regarding baseline, I think now is the time to work out a deal with winter park planning and zoning to bring a new planner and have monthly meetings with planning commission and town board to make sure we are on the same page as to how we want to plan out and develop the town and property around the town. Baseline is overcharging for their services and at their rate, affordable housing is not attainable. If they charge twice as much, they should be able to do four times the work of any on-site planner. Value is in the results, not the cost. It is absolutely unacceptable the town and baseline failed to get the paper, the paper work work out for the development on Muse. This is proof that baseline does not care about the town or the people living or developing at the town or Fraser. Parnell Quinn. Parnell Quinn, trustee Quinn. Um, I was, um, I think it's integral in a community like this that we have a, I was not, I was never in favor of a consultant for the, the planning. I mean, you, you need to have somebody that lives in your community for planning. Um, they need to be able to see what's happening here. Um, we have a lot of development happening. We need people that are somebody that's here and can see what's happening, having them come up once a month or once every two months into our community is not an ideal situation for our community. And, um, and can we, so I'm, I'm in favor of number two. I agree. Can we still use baseline as a consultant when we need? I mean, I, we're not firing. That's, we're we're going to continue two, with baseline. Well, no, until, but until once we, we have somebody in place, I guess my concern, I, my understanding was baseline pointed out several things that were problematic with our in our code and helped us correct those in my understanding like um, right. not yet no. but I pointed out some things that were you know either inconsistencies or needed to be updated or whatever I just, I just kind of like the idea of someone that has a broader scope and works with many municipalities mm -hmm. in Colorado and understand you know, where the pitfalls are versus just having someone on site that ha may not have the, the scope of um, experience. Well, the new planner may put fresh eyes on it too. Can I, yeah. can I speak to Lewis's comment there briefly? Uh, before Catherine left, we did talk and explore bringing in what they call a planner two position, someone to offset and help with some of that planning process. It is a heavy lift for one person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes our development can be a little contentious and uh, you know, to keep people uh, up to speed, upbeat, and positive. Uh, having a little assistance uh, is certainly welcome. Um, nationwide, there's a shortage on planners as, as they're moving into the private sector. So hiring a planner would be a struggle. But one of the options that you talked about is, is we could have a contractual relationship to handle a certain percentage of the, pro of the planning process. And those costs would be probably significantly reduced. Our code does allow for pass-through uh, costs for our consultants and so forth like that. Um, so you have that option, and you're going to have you, you're going to have baseline on board until it's ready to do a full handoff of the projects. So if you change number two to say something, I mean, you, you basically, the way I read this, once we have an internal town planner, that's can operate without support, then they're on their own. Is there, you know, a way we can build a, a process to have a that consulting services available? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about having a assistant town planner? Because that adds more cost. It does. And what we're asking, this isn't not a recommendation, make a motion to do this. What right. we're looking for from the board is their direction. If they want to have an internal planner, We'll start the process. What happens to baseline down the future is really going to be subject to having a planner on board, understanding the scope of that work, giving them up to speed, and then making a determination, uh, you know, nine months or so after the new planner's on board. We have something called a, a PDD, which which is kind of unusual in Colorado. It's, it's outside of the norm. So understanding the complexities of of that particular aspect of planning as it applies in Fraser can be difficult. Uh, but we're not asking for a, mod a motion to go with option number two. I'm just asking if this this town's priority is to in-house planning, all I need is is thumbs up from you and we'll work on doing that. And I would imagine if baseline really stepped up to the plate and got wonderful 
while we're looking for a, a planner, we could just stay with them. That's true as well. And that, that's why I was thought we were doing sort of a corrective action. Here, here are the problems, here are deficiencies. Give them an opportunity to correct those. If they can't, then by all means, we need to hire somebody. Yeah, I think option two really is about the idea of saying start the, I think hiring a planner is gonna be very challenging yeah. um, because we saw that earlier. Um, and I think that that is a start that process but we're still continuing to work with baseline and trying to optimize with uh, that relationship. Um, Winter Park has a hybrid model, um, and I don't want to build a hybrid model from the start. Uh, if we're going to really commit to a planner in-house, I want to make sure that they are able to understand the code and really have the time and bandwidth to dive into that and make sure that they understand all the pieces while they're essentially sitting in while baselines are doing stuff so they can see see it in action and then you can say okay at this point where's our skill set where are gaps do we need to make sure that we have a contract to fill certain voids or a certain volume or whatever and then we can move forward um so from you there. See a, a hybrid model what what exactly they have internal planners but they also when uh, on certain projects if they're big enough scope they can contract out okay that's fine yeah. So we as a statutory town still have the ability to change our building code, right? Oh yeah. So what's the why could Winter Park and Fraser's building departments not be combined? They well again, like Rob explained, they don't have the capacity. Uh um, that, that's one thing, but like and they don't want to. They don't want that, to. And that's a, that's another thing. But <laughs> but it is if they wanted to, it would be possible. Certainly. Okay. Sure. So and there's a government agreement to expand uh, our, our building services to include planning services. Yeah. I mean, we've done it with the police department and public works, like transit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems to make we a lot take of sense. The budget we have allocated for a town planner and go to Winter Park and say, this is what we're willing to, you know, pitch in. Okay, Lewis and Brian. Yeah. Go twist their arm and make them take yeah. it. And, and and you, you would need to. Get, that's what you guys are saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but if they're it, if they're option. already overwhelmed, right, and can't meet the demand, then we're not going to be providing a good service to the people that need the planners' advice and services. It's kind of like because this, it's yeah it's starting all over. It's like the same situation uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were looking to establish uh, who might can help with engineering services. And I reached out to JVA because they're, they have an office locally. Uh, they just simply didn't have the capacity to take on additional work, even though they're doing, they're the town engineer for, for Winter Park. Mm -hmm. You know, Winter Park has, you know, for whatever their reasons, their budget and so forth, uh, they have a model that seems to be working. Um, baseline can work, you know, and if we do hire an internal planner, I would recommend of course, I'm not going to be here to make that recommendation, but uh, I would foresee if I was going to be here not to do a transfer midstream with an ongoing development is let that person step in with new developments. Uh, everything that's on our plate right now, with a couple of exceptions, is transferred. Even the Muse Drive was transferred uh, based on initial conversations and discussions with. with it's transferred to what? from Catherine Trotter to baseline. Gotcha. They, they had to pick things up. They had to research, okay, what gotcha. communications, how do we, they had to learn the code. They had to figure out, okay, what was communicated, what was said. Uh, a lot of things were said in kind of just one-on-one -on -one conversations, which is typical in, in the early stages of the planning process, but it leads people to different expectations when we, when we made that switch. So uh, I will say that the projects that baseline are picking up from scratch right now are running smoothly. Uh, they are tracking their time. Monica is on board as well as is helping with some of the coordination of that. Um, but Monica does not have the capacity and, and we're not going to ask her. She's done the training to be a planner. Um, she's a program management is, is her specialty. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hearing a general consensus that we need to be looking for. Yeah. Number two. And um, Andy Miller called and left me a message this morning. He's the chair of the planning commission. And he encouraged us to move towards having a planner on site. Okay. He felt it was really important. Yep. I do. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. 
next is support for US 40 safety and mobility improvements. Um, this is Ed. I'm, I'm not real comfortable with the way it's written, like the way I wrote this, which, <laughs> which, I, which I didn't write this. <laughs> so um, I, I would like to table this isn't a high priority. And we get this. I'd like to table this because I'm not comfortable. You want to redraft yeah, it a little bit? A very I will point out that this is based on uh, the Northwest TPR. Uh, we have had an approved uh, TPR, list, which is transportation planning region. Thank you. Uh, they are the ones that has helped uh, develop a master plan for Grand County and the rest of the, the region uh, for construction projects, prioritizing that. And they've done a really good job of doing that. And under the, this current construction season and the grant application process, um, we had projects on the books, including the widening of US 40 between Kremlin and Steamboat Springs. Uh, I believe there was also some other issues at Red Dirt Hill that was on a priority. Uh, the TPR made application for a grant. It got denied. Uh, CDOT also stepped in and changed some of the priorities, repurposed some of that. Um, what this letter is, and there's a timeline. And apparently, unfortunately, there's layers of time. I mean, this is a form letter that was prepared by the TPR that went to all the municipalities asking for a letter of support. Um, the only added part that I put in there was the one to the third paragraph to get just a little personal player to this, uh, but they want these responses back so that they can gather them together when they reapply. When do they need them back? Right? Because I'm not going to sign this as it's written. Okay. What's the problem that you have with it? Well, they don't even include the turnouts go as far as Kremlin. Right. So the pieces that are in, the pieces that we're looking for funding that got denied are the, are the pieces that they talked about here. So yeah, our stretch of 40 is not getting much except for Red Dirt Hill. And how do you describe Red Dirt Hill from where to where? Because some of the left-hand turns closer to Tabernash, I feel are more dangerous than Red Dirt Hill. The Highlands? Would, yeah, the Highlands, know. especially the last one, this way where that man was killed. Just, um, yeah, I mean the Red Dirt Hell piece was from from Andy, so that predates my time on on the Northwest TPR. Um, but they kept it in, so that was good of them. I mean, it's it's the stretch that Andy wanted the most help with, um, and so yeah, we're, I mean, to add anything about our stretch of forty at this point is is pointless. Um, because this is what we, what the Northwest TPR requested and got denied. So if we can help get this through, then we can focus on our side of 40, our piece of 40 after that. I'd also like to point out that Brian Sirk-Vinnick has now been elected as the co-chair of the TPR. Awesome. So we have Good. better representation uh, here on this side of the valley. So yeah. maybe we'll get, maybe they'll know yeah, who we are. <laughs> who we are. Yeah. Exactly. So if the mayor doesn't want to sign it, should we can we make it from the Fraser Town Board? If you're not comfortable it's signing it, you're not gonna sign it. You know, we I, I, I doubt Mayor Pete ever or our secretary Pete even reads it, but I mean it's it's not very well written and I, I think we need to talk about our own. Yeah, I mean, our our stretch is not on the table right now. I'm well, going okay. to do my best to get it on the table, Let's but the table. but at least mention it. but it's going to help us in the Northwest TPR if we help them get this passed. So that left turn into the Highlands, closest to Tabernacle, where that young man was killed. I've almost been caught there by someone making a left turn if I'm coming south and the sun is shining and everyone's headlight or taillights look like brake lights. You come up pretty fast on someone who's make, standing there and there's no way, no place to go. So 
this letter, like you say, at this stage, Brian, is kind of boilerplate for reapplying for what they were denied. That's exactly right. And Phil, do you have a problem just with how it's written? That is poorly right. written, but right. not the content? Well, the content as well. Okay. I mean, we need to be. I well, understand what they're, you guys are, the TPR is trying so, to do with So, you know what? I think I propose that the uh, mayor and Brian sit down and look through it and see if there's a something that they work out together that's appropriate and then that we authorize you to sign it. Yeah, if you don't like the way it's written, why don't you write it? <laughs> you know? But right. and Brian's I mean, this, got this the is the informational, right? We don't need to take any action on this. It's, it's informational it's, for the board. It's not. It's not. And okay. and they probably you're, not you're doing anything either. It it could be rewritten. They provided a form letter. They said you could change it if you want. Mm -hmm. So right. let's okay. change it. No, we'll, we'll take care of it. I don't know. Um, I will find that out. I'll send it to an email and copy the board. Okay. So we are at updates now. Yeah. Any updates from anybody? I went to the cast meeting last week in Steamboat. That was my first one. It's the Colorado Association of Ski Towns. Um, interesting experience. Um, it was a one day session essentially, um, but the best part was just getting to know other people from other ski towns and realizing we all have the same problems. And, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, we can talk to each other. So just opening those doors were really nice. Um, yeah, the content of the one day session was mediocre, but um, but meeting everybody made it worth it. So, okay. anybody else? <clears throat> uh, I did send out an email today. The Northwest uh, Council of Governments did hire the grant navigator. Uh, we're happy to have that position on board. That person will be able to assist, uh, you know, towns within the TPR within the Northwest Cog uh, uh, region. Uh, to navigate the the hundreds of grant opportunities that's going to be pouring out over the next several years. So thank you so much, uh, John, for that hire. I don't know if you wanted to make an update about that at all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other updates? Okay. Lois, do you want to make a motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion that we enter in the two executive sessions conference with the town attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice for on specific legal questions under CRS section 246402.4b and for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 246402.4e regarding litigation to include town attorney Kent Whitmer, Special Counsel John Shamil, Town Manager Ed Cannon, and Assistant Town Manager Michael Brock. And then number two, the second executive session, for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CRS Section 246-402-4E, Town Manager Recruitment, to include John and of Northwest Cog. A second. Both motions. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, just for the public, um, we will not be coming back because um, there's no action to take after this. So we will um, we'll be ending the meeting and um, moving on. So, and our first executive session because um, Ken, you want to do this? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. So it's my opinion that uh, the matters that will be discussed in the first executive session are privileged and confidential, and therefore the meeting does not need to be recorded. We will be recording the second. So thanks, everybody, and the public for joining us. We really appreciate you showing up. Thank you. Michael, do you have uh, John Camille's email address? Uh, sure.
sure I can find it. Send him a link to this Zoom meeting. It'd be better if he's zooming in instead of just calling in on my phone. I think I think you can hear it. Oh, okay. My office is open. You can hear everything. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 That's a history. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.